somebody on the way here told me to break a leg, and so I actually fell on my way here, and I can't move. <laughs> it's okay, but it's fine. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we're here to celebrate the second um, edition, um, as you know. But mostly, I'm going to give a talk, this talk on aging and creativity. So, and partly um, because. I think it's time to talk about this, partly because I turned 75 this year. And um, yeah, and also because it's part of my ongoing creativity studies that I do as I continue writing pieces and composing poems. So this talk has um, three parts. Uh, the first, I want to dispel some common myths um, about old age and old people and about aging and creativity. And so then in the middle, we'll stop uh, and have questions and answers, um, have room for a few. And then I'll finish with um, what I think are some advantages of being an old creator. <laughs> if you're not there yet, you will get there. Uh, <laughs> So you can't get far into the subject of aging without hitting ageism. The far-reaching bias and prejudice against older people that saturates our culture so thoroughly that you often don't even notice it. Why is it that so many people are reluctant to state their age and it's the height of rudeness to ask a person's age? Because it's bad to be old and the older you get, the worse it is. And this uh, recognizes mainstream American culture and some other cultures. As we know, elders are honored and respected and have key roles to play. But the thing to know, and I think it's the most important thing I would have to say tonight, is that um, self-inflicted ageism or internalized ageism is a cause of decline. In the past few months, is this is the light low enough so that yeah. you can see this? Okay, okay. In the past few months, I've read um, a whole bunch of books on aging, and they all say we should walk more. <laughs> Every one of them. <laughs> um, strangely, very few mention doing creative work, um, but they do say that having a passion or having some work to do that is so absorbing that it takes something like uh, three hours a day increases well-being in old age. And um, that includes, of course, writing, painting, writing poems, and photography, whatever you do. Um, and of course, no matter how old you are, creative work increases well-being. But I'm interested in old artists, old writers, old painters, old photographers, old filmmakers, old poets, old composers. I'm interested in artists who become very productive or remain very productive into very old age, and in old age produce significant and at times transcendent work. And so throughout this presentation, I will be throwing up figures. Um, and it's a, it's a random selection. I could have easily picked a different selection because there's so many of them. We could be here till midnight if I, <laughs> but we're not going to be here. Um, and f because for me, they're models of how to grow into old age if one should be so lucky as to get to old age. And also, they also serve to blast the stereotypes out of the water. But even though this is about older creators, it's also the case that creativity and doing creative work is a human birthright that belongs to every person, no matter their age or state of being. So this is Lawrence Ferlinghetti, uh, you know, famous beat poet, founder of City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco. Um, he wrote the book um, Coney Island of the Mind in 1958. Um, and it has sold like a million copies. Um, and he wrote many, many poetry books. He's also a painter. He's 99 years old, and he has a new novel coming out. It's titled Little Boy, and the pub date will be March 24th, 2019, on his 100th birthday. Aww. 
That's a painting one. So, okay, five myths or common ideas about old age which are either questionable or flat out wrong. <clears throat> one, old equals sick and decrepit. Though I'm feeling <laughs> decrepit. <laughs> I'm not feeling old though, I'm feeling decrepit though. Oh. Um, anyway, so we are biological beings. We get sick, children get sick, young people get sick, middle-aged people get sick, and some of those always die, and, and old people get sick, and we all are going to die. Uh, but ill health, of, you know, as we know, ill health can strike at any time uh, of life. Um, and, whoops, wait a minute here. And, um, and poor, so, Physical decline is inevitable, and um, and uh, um, uh, death is inevitable. I guess I said that. Um, poor health is not inevitable. Um, the stereotype of old people as frail and debilitated is a stereotype. One 85-year-old may be dealing with an illness or a chronic uh, problem. Another may be running the Boston Marathon. One uh, 85-year-old did run the Boston Marathon last year. Um, so, and of course, I know ailments, ailments such as cancer, cardiac, and others are ailments of older age, but they're not a corollary. They're not a natural corollary of old age. So at this point, statistics, the oldest old, which right now are, this is a sort of sliding um, number as <coughs> longevity increases. But um, the oldest old, or 85 and older now, live, a, a half of the oldest old live independently, though some are dealing with chronic illnesses. And there is an increasing cohort of well old people and even well, very old people, some of whom have recovered from these earlier uh, illnesses. So the point is that if and when we do get sick, it's not because we're old. Got that? <laughs> okay, good. Now, part two of this is that creativity, a life of art making or poem making or novel writing, does not have a one-to-one -one relationship with robust health. So um, you, can you, know, you can have a disability and still be a powerful creator. This is Eva Zeisel. She was an industrial designer, a ceramicist, Hungarian born, um, spent five years in the Soviet Union and uh, then 16 months in a, in a Stalin prison camp and then and of which 12 was uh, in solitary confinement. And then she got to America eventually, and her show at the Museum of Modern Art in 1946 was the first one-woman show at MoMA. And uh, she lived to be 105, as you can see. That's one of her pieces. She was an industrial designer, so you can buy this for $20, actually. Um, I was going to buy one, but I was I got, it was too late, <laughs> pass it around, see, here. So she was an industrial designer, so her products are mass produced. In her 90s, Zysel went blind from macular de degeneration, but she continued to design using her hands with balsa wood, and she continued to get big commissions. An interviewer asked her, was it more difficult to work like that? And her answer was, the process, getting shapes out of air, is always the same. The singer-songwriter Johnny Cash was 71 years old when he died um, in 2003 from complications of diabetes. His hard-drinking, hard-driving life was hard on his body. In the 1980s, he underwent stomach surgery to correct problems caused by years of amphetamine use. And in 1987, he underwent heart surgery. In the late 1990s, he was diagnosed with shy Drager syndrome. This is a catastrophic nervous system disorder that causes loss of fine motor skills, mask appearance of the face, difficulty chewing and swallowing, dizziness, fainting, difficulty walking, 
difficulty speaking, changes in the voice, and a monotone speaking voice. In his last decade, the great singer embraced rock music and went on an alternative rock tour. He teamed up with a producer and they made six new albums in his last decade. The last one completed two days before his death. The first one, a Grammy. The albums include grim and powerful songs such as God's Gonna Cut You Down. In 2002, the year before his death, Cash released the penultimate album, um, an astonishing eclectic range of covers and original songs. Four months before his own death, June Carter Cash, the love of his life, died. <clears throat> and the next day, he said to his producer, I need to have something to do every day, otherwise there's no reason for me to be here. Cash worked every day for three more months. A week before his death, he completed the final track of his final album. His voice is broken. The songs are mournful, slow, painful, full of grief. Johnny Cash has never been more powerful. Of course, we have Henri Matisse. Um, after being operated on for cancer at the age of 71, he could no longer leave his wheelchair or his bed. And this is when he began his amazing cutouts. So, being old doesn't mean being sick, and being sick doesn't mean you can't be creative and do creative work. Now we're gonna talk about senior moments. And while we're thinking of, we're talking about senior moments, this is Maya Angelou, which we can gaze upon. She published 43 books. That would be seven autobiographies, including I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, a beautiful book, oh my gosh. 17 books of poetry, three books of essays, two cookbooks, seven children's books, and seven plays. And in the last year of her life, she composed the last poetry book and her last memoir. So we can look at her while we're talking about senior moments. Okay, when a young person forgets something, we don't attribute it to their age, unless they're five years old and they have lost their mittens. <laughs> but if you're 20 years old and you forget your keys, we don't mention age. And, but that's not even the main point. The main point is a study by linguists led by Michael Ramsgar, um, University of Tübingen in Germany. Um, they programmed a computer to simulate the human brain. And, um, they, and then they load the computer with more and more experiences, information, vocabulary, until they have an approximation of an older brain. And the more loaded up with information the computer is, the slower the computer is at coming up with words and with the names of things. The computer is not in decline. <laughs> <laughs> it has a bigger job to do in calling up a name or a word. So the lead scientist, Michael Ramsgar, said that when he started, I was a firm believer in the dotage curve. But the simulations mapped cognitive, cognitive processes so, uh, so accurately that it slowly forced him to acknowledge that he didn't need to invoke decline at all. And then there's another thing. According to a study at Duke University where they did MRIs on the brains of younger people and then older people, um, younger brains tend to use one side of the brain or, another, or the other, depending on the task. Um, older brains use both sides simultaneously in a more synchronized way. Very interesting. This, all this neuroscience that's coming up is really interesting. Um, and this actually gives the older brain more access to more associations, um, which is great for creative work. <clears throat> And uh, it gives the older brain a larger resource base, actually, for creative work. So I think 
this is an opportunity to consider, stop saying to ourselves and to out loud, I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's just a suggestion. <laughs> so now the third common um, idea, which is that old people are going to suck up all the resources in the next few decades. So first, I want to point out, um, and you know, it's been pointed out, and I'll point it out again. Social Security insurance. It, Social Security is insurance that you pay for. It is not an entitlement. Thank you. Um, if you didn't pay for it, you don't get it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, okay, so the number of people over 65 is rising, as we know, until by 2030, 20% um, of the U.S. population will be over 65. And it's not only the baby boom generation is a bubble, yes, but it's also the um, longevity is increasing. So this is going to keep happening after the baby boom generation. Um, so, um, so for example, in 1980, there were 720,000 Americans over age 90. There's not going to be a test on these numbers. Um, in 2010, there were 1.9 million Americans over 90. And this trend is continuing on. But health care costs are not rising proportionally. Interesting, huh? And that's big. Hmm? They're not, no, they're not. <laughs> and why would that be? <laughs> it's, probably, it's a lot because uh, people are taking seriously lifestyle changes um, and people are healthier. I mean, my grandparents um, believed that exercise was bad for you. And so, I mean, the big changes in um, lifestyle and you know, eating and uh, things like that. Um, so also, the percentage of very old people who are in fact living in health is rising. Um, and the statistic from the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on an Aging Society, which is very interesting, from 1982 to 1994, the number of elders unable to perform daily tasks decreased by almost 3.6%, which meant that there were 1.2 million fewer disabled elders uh, in, in 1994. And that's old <coughs> statistics, but this trend is also continuing. And, and right now, um, sadly, the percentage of younger people who are living healthy lives is, is falling. That's really sad. But finally, the MacArthur Foundation found that when you support older people, younger people benefit, since obviously older people care deeply about younger people and their families and, and, and outside their families. Um, so um, the, in South Africa, when older women in extended families were given pensions, over time it was found that their granddaughters were healthier and better educated, which is obvious, but it's also true. <laughs> so, so let's think of the burgeoning numbers of older people, including many of us, as a tremendous resource that our society now has that it did not have 50 years ago. Should we have a cheer for that? <laughs> okay. okay. Um, okay, ha this is uh, Marsha Muth. Um, she was a Santa Fe painter. Happiness. Um, happiness, there have been tons of studies on happiness. Um, there's a United Nations study on happiness in different countries. Our country is number 18 right now, but that's not relevant to this talk. Um, so. Um, so happiness happens in, as an average. Um, it happens in a U-curve. 18 to 20-year-olds, 20 21-year-olds are happy. Grace, are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I rest my case. Um, <laughs> 
Um, that's my first first cousin once removed. Okay, um, and then um, gradually uh, it dips till middle age, around forty and fifty. It's uh, uh, the unhappiest period. I think a lot of stresses. People have a lot of stress. And then it starts climbing again. Does anyone have a guess as to the happiest age? 60. 60. Wrong. 90. 90. Wrong. 67. Wrong. 125. 94. 98. Oh, that's true. Um, <laughs> So Marsha Muth, when she was 88, she said, I find that my 80s have been even more fun than my 70s. <laughs> so I want to recognize, though, that poverty is a big cause of unhappiness. And according to the AARP, 10 million people over the age of 50 in America live below the poverty line. 10 million, and one in seven over the age of 65 are at risk of not being able to meet their most basic uh, needs. So now five, now we get to aging and creativity, the topic of our talk. <laughs> it's only 26 minutes and 36 seconds have passed. <laughs> um, <laughs> this gizmo is really fascinating. Yes. Um, so the whole topic of aging and creativity has a sordid past, if you ask me. And it involves two ideas. One, if you haven't created something pretty significant, pretty darn good, by the time you are 40, you never will. Boo. Um, <laughs> and then secondly, the idea of peak ages of creativity, which are found to be um, in the late 30s and early 40s. Boo. Um, anyway, these destructive ideas originated with a highly influential book published in 1953, the same year that this Time magazine cover came out. Um, it was published by Princeton University Press. It was H.C. Lehman's Age and Achievement. And it was a study of male achievers, of course, from mathematicians to poets. And his study supposedly established these two ideas, um, before 40 or, or your toast, and peak ages of creativity, as empirical data. And he was thereafter cited in support of age discriminatory policies such as mand mandatory retirement, um, which in the United States was made illegal and actually in 1994. Um, but um, it's like all over Europe and uh, other countries. Now, Lehman is old stuff, but these ideas are quite current. Um, there are current scientific papers arguing these things. And what's the problem with their, what's, what's the problem? One, they conflate chronological age with career age. Okay, so if you start at 20 doing some art or something, by the time 20 years have passed, you're pretty darn good. So that would bring you to 39 or 40. Um, and, uh, and, and, Scientists are included in these many of these studies, and with science, there's no, uh, there's virtually no means of late entry. So you know, um, and also their criteria for what they're counting as great art are things like um, how many times a poem has been anthologized, or the paintings that bring the highest price. If you're an artist, this is crazy. Like what? I mean, I know they need to have some kind of numbers to count, but I call BS. <laughs> I do. Um, this isn't a portrait of late Paul Cezanne. Um, <laughs> so here are some counter examples. And I, again, I just picked some at random. We could be here till midnight with more examples. 
Okay, and Cezanne is one of them. Now, he's considered the father of modernism, more or less. Um, and he's a counter example that if you haven't achieved something by age 40, you never will. He would have been entirely overlooked by these studies since he had not sold a single painting by the time he was 40 years old. Of course, he was working and working and working and working. But these studies don't count people that are working and working. They, they're looking at recognition. That's what they're looking at. So he's a counter example. Um, I have sworn, he said, I have sworn to die painting. And he did. He painted right up to the end. Here's another counter example. Diana Athill, age 100. Athill was a well-known um, London editor. She edited Jean Rhys and other uh, people. Um, and she published her own first book of short stories at age uh, 45. And so her output was two books of short stories, a novel, and 10 memoirs. She brought out her second book of short stories when she was 94. Her memoir, Alive Alive, came out in 2016 when she was 98. So Adhill counters the 40, year 40 deadline for doing something significant, and she also counters the peak ages of creativity idea. And these studies also confound quantity with quality. I understand they have no way, I mean, people would say, well, that's just your taste if they actually try to make aesthetic judgments, but I understand they can't do that, but, um, but. Um, sometimes an older artist will slow down to do his or her last work. And sometimes that's because it's a totally new thing. Um, so here's uh, Giuseppe Verdi, Italian composer of operas. By the time, and he fits in with Peak Ages idea because by the time he was 50, he had composed two dozen operas, including Rigoletto and La Traviata. Then there, all of his operas were uh, tragedies, and um, he was the most important Italian composer of his time. At the age of 74, he composed what was considered his crowning achievement, which was Otello. And people thought, well, that's it, great, brilliant, well done, perfect, no, congratulations. Then he took a rather long time to compose Falstaff, which was a comedy is a comedy. He took longer because he was feeling his way. It was totally new for him, it, though it incorporated elements of his, um, um, of his types of melodies that he did, that he was known for. But then they would be interrupted by the action. So it became weirdly fragmented. Um, so there's this whole conversation, which we can't get into tonight, about late style. but. Um, that's an interesting example of late style. Um, and the painter Claude Monet is another, but we can't go into it tonight, uh, another example of uh, major, very late work. Um, so Now here we are at Anna Mary Robertson Moses, the painter that used to be called Grandma. <laughs> and I put a we hung a picture of her up over there, too. That was 1953. She started painting when she was 76. She had raised five children, um, and as she said, I just didn't have time to paint before. And me being, do we all know this painter? Yeah, OK. Um, me being kind of an intellectual snob, <clears throat> I kind of used to turn up my nose at her art, especially since she sold for example, 16 million Hallmark cards in 1947 alone. <laughs> so like, um, <laughs> but Peter Sheldahl, the New Yorker critic who has the best eye, and he's a wonderful art critic, has set me straight about Moses. Moses belongs smack inside the canon of 20th century art, and then he uh, talks about her paintings um, and made me see. Uh, and I agree with. Uh, Sheldahl, that we should stop calling Anna Mary Robertson Moses grandma. It's condescending like calling a person you don't know sweetie. 
It's, if you call a person you love dearly sweetie because you're, you're sweetie, that's one thing. But to call an unknown person sweetie is condescending. OK, and other creators who started after 40. There's so many of these. It's like, come on, you guys. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Daniel Defoe uh, died age 71, same year, same age as Johnny Cash. He published his first novel, Robinson Crusoe, when he was 59. Marcel Proust died at age 51, very young. He was writing, of course, but if you're writing but not publishing, you're not going to be included in these statistics. So creating isn't what they're measuring. They're measuring. Uh, recognition. That's what they're measuring. Um, so um, he published the first volume, Proust published the first volume of In Search of Lost Time when he was 43. Raymond Chandler, The Big Sleep, that great detective novel, takes place in LA. Um, this was his first novel. He was age 44. Annie Proust, She's now 83. She published her first collection of short stories when she was 53, her first novel, Postcards, when she was 57. And um, let's see, for Postcards, she got the Penn Faulkner. And her second novel, The Shipping News, won the Pulitzer and the National Book Award. And her output is, and she's still working very actively. Her output so far is five novels, four collections of short stories. Of course, Annie Prue was a journalist before she started writing literary writing. Penelope Lively. She published her first novel at age 44. After that, she has so far published 17 novels, five books of short stories, 28 children's books, and five memoirs, not counting other writing that she is doing. Her first novel, is that a little bit obnoxious? Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's really, honestly, <laughs> we're supposed to appreciate this. Uh, um, the first novel, uh, The Road to Litchfield, um, was on the short list for the Booker Prize. And of course, Moon Tiger did win the Booker Prize. Richard Adams, uh, Watership Down, you know that book? Um, he. Uh, he published that at age 52. He started writing at age 46. Toni Morrison, she uh, published The Bluest Eye when she was 39. So that's kind of like, OK, maybe. Uh, Sula, when she was 42, she won the Pulitzer, the American Book Award, of course, the Nobel when she was 62. She's written 11 novels, eight nonfiction books, five children's books, and two plays. Um, so. Um, these figures and other ones um, are counter examples to the idea that the late 30s, of the late 30s and 40s being peak ages of creativity. Um, and they're also counter examples to the idea that if you haven't achieved anything great by the time you're 40, you're toast. And I particularly, that one, I can remember being in my 30s and the Yale Prize for Younger Poets used to have that quote, fact in its guidelines, in its guidelines. And I always resented it because I knew I wouldn't make it. <laughs> it's like, you know, it, the great poets will have a significant first book before they're 40. Um, so, so it's destructive, I think. Um, and others, and scientists, other scientists, other social scientists also argue this. For example, so I mean, this, these ideas also have a lot of people arguing against them. Um, so. Um, uh, the sociologist Dean Keith Simonton discusses the pervasive and overblown misconception that older creators are over the hill. And he criticizes the use of layman's work in, f in formulating age discriminatory policies. So, um, so um, OK. So that's, now, we, now we're going to have questions. If you have a few questions, so we'll have our question period now. And then um, I'm going to try to stand up. I mean, I don't know if I can, but <laughs> I'm going to try to stand up when we have questions. And then I'll end with what I think are the advantages of being an old or older uh, creator. OK, so yes. So when did, how old was Verde when he wrote the famous Requiem? I have no idea. Andrea, is Andrea here? 
Oh, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but, but Verdi wrote a lot of, of his music. I mean, in middle age, he did write a lot of his music, yeah, and on into his older age, yeah, but I don't know. Any other questions that I don't know the answer to? <laughs> yes? Would you account for depression at an older age? I mean, after all, the decay of your body, you have to face it. And there are a number of other circumstances right. that play a role. Right. And so, in a way, you're also signing out from a whole number of things. You're losing people around you. Yeah. The older you get, the more your circle gets narrow. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of reasons there for uh, a, a real alteration in your life and reason for depression. So I'm wondering, the people you have given, you know, have they struggled with depression? Have you encountered a subject in your research? Um, yeah, I think, see, I think that, um, yeah, sure, like Monet had terrible problems toward the end of it. I mean, exactly for these reasons. He was losing people. He lost his son. Um, he lost his wife, you know, I mean, and he was going, he had eye trouble, and he was a painter. Um, and so, um, yeah, I also, yes, I mean, depression can be a problem. You have to, I mean, I feel like I don't want to speak for others on this subject, but I feel that um, in growing older, you are losing people the older you get. I mean, if you're 98, you've lost everyone that you grew up with or knew you when you were younger, pretty much, you know. And so I think that um, actually creative work, doing a, you know, a creative, uh, having a creative work that you're doing is a tremendous um, ameliorative uh, thing to do because yes, it's very common. And, and isolation, people talk about isolation. Well, if you're involved, like in our writers, writers community, we have a great community. If you're involved in a creative, you know, music or, uh, or composing or, or ceramics or whatever, or painting or writing, you have a community and that is, that's a cross-generation community. And it also helps, I mean, the, the more um, interrelationships there are between um, between um, older people and younger people, the more healthy that is, um, because there's a lot of good cross fertilization. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any other? Yes. So, um, the, your comment about as we age, mm -hmm. we use more balance, both sides of the left and the right side of the brain. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that before, and I find it fascinating. I guess that's the definition of maturity. And uh, that, but is that research recent or is Did I make it up, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question is, yeah, sorry. The question is, um, the research about uh, both sides of the brain, um, uh, that older people use both sides of the brain. It's, um, I have to go back to my slide, but it's Duke University. And it was 2002. Um, yeah, so you can look it up. No, I didn't make it. <laughs> it's a good idea, though. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Verdi was 61. Oh, Verdi was 61. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I wonder if you have ever heard this. I heard it many years ago that uh, people who are autistic have more of a tendency to be depressed. People who are? Who are creative and oh. artistic. Uh, artistic, OK. Um, there is a huge literature on that. Um, it's not exactly, I mean, you know, from my, I mean, I wrote something on it, but it was quite a while ago. So maybe this is through the hole in my hat. Um, it's, it is true that um, there's something about People who are very creative, um, they might have more relatives who are in the autism spectrum or um, in um, or schizophrenic or you know have mental illness problems. Um, but uh, basically, it's somewhat of a stereotype. I mean, there's something to it, but there's there are many uh, very 
mentally healthy, happy artists, so it's sort of questionable, yeah. I thought it was maybe it was just that they're more sensitive. More sensitive, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure, yeah. Yes, back there. Yeah, you mentioned poverty mm -hmm. as a factor that kind of impacts things and can sort of skew some of this. And you mentioned personal lifestyle choices. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering sort of other things that are uh, sort of external to people like the impact of race, racism, and sort of the systemic uh, you know, heritage trauma. All these things that we have huge sections of the population that carry these things. Right, right. With them into old age. Right. And I wonder if any of the studies sort of touch on any of those questions. Um, so the question is, um, there are all these, um, there's poverty, there are traumatic experiences, there's racism that impacts people when they're younger, and do, how does it affect people going into old age? Well, um, of course it does, um, although, I, again, doing creative work is tremendously healing. It's tremendously healing, um, but uh, it's kind of... Um, ridiculous that many of these, uh, the aging literature um, actually, you know, will give a passing reference but won't go into detail about those populations, you know, because, yeah, I don't know why. Um, yeah. Any other? Yes. Way back there. Priscilla, do you find that your uh, methods of working, your, uh, the way you go about creating have changed in, you know, as decades move? Like, do you stay up until 3 in the morning, not as much? I never stay up till 3 in the morning, let me tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, uh, I, I'm going to end the talk with how I feel, uh, so I'll save it for the end of the talk, where how I feel um, age has helped me as a creator. Yeah, so maybe wait on that. Um, so, yes? Uh, I, I have a question, another I, I hope, Ned, that if you are a great artist, you can't do anything else. You have to. If you're a writer, you have to write. If you're a painter, you have to paint. The, the, the examples you showed kind of belie that. I mean, how, what did these people do before they were 73 and started writing in the case of the <laughs> Well, they did different things like... Um, so the question is, what did these people do who were um, doing something else before they started writing at age 52? Actually, no. Oh. The question, my question is a little different. Did they, what did, did they not have the passion and develop the passion later? Or where's the drive? What do they do with the drive? I mean, why does the drive allow them to do something other than their passion, their creative passion? Well, they, some of them were doing, I, I mean, uh, they didn't just spring from like 0.0. I mean, for example, um, Moses, um, she raised five children, but she was always doing something with her hands. She used to make these embroidery pictures. So she came into the fullness of painting, and also she started painting because she had arthritis and she couldn't embroider anymore. But she uh, came into painting, so it wasn't like, oh, a surprise, now I'm passionate about painting. Somebody like Cezanne, of course, was very passionate about painting from day one. He just was not recognized. Um, and then, let's see, um, the um, Richard, uh, what's his name, who, who did Watership, Watership Down, he was a civil, he had a career as a civil servant, and so his, um, uh, he, his, he started, he would write these stories for his children, and so he's an example of someone who really switched into uh, a you know writing career after another career, but many of them um, they they didn't just spring from z point zero. They were doing uh, things, but their lives in it, sometimes they just didn't weren't recognized. Does that answer? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. Last, last question. Okay, last question. Yes. I'm curious if there are any creative endeavors that seem to be better with age than others. I know growing up, it seemed like uh, 
there were an awful lot of elderly jazz and blues music. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now we have the Rolling Stones. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly do have the Rolling Stones. <laughs> but um, does it seem like there are some that are that are either higher profile or maybe it's easier to live longer if you're doing that? Or is it just those are the things that we noticed more? I don't know. The, the, the question is, um, do we notice more older uh, creators? Is that what the question is now than we did before? Um, or in a particular pursuit. In a, yeah, it, like jazz. Well, or rock music or... Um, um, you know, I'm not sure. In the last 50 years, um, longevity has increased tremendously, and this is like affecting everything. So, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Because when I was growing up, I was very unaware of most creators altogether. So, you know. Um, so, okay. Um, continuing right along. These are my personal thoughts about the advantages of being an older creator. For one thing, you realize that the time is not forever. So this focuses your mind. You ask, what work is most important for me to do in whatever time I have left? So I think, and I think this applies to everyone, uh, everyone, uh, whatever they're doing. Um, that at, at toward the end of your life, I mean, you could anyone could die at any time, but we're all going to die, you know, sometime. So, um, and, and when you're older, you start becoming more and more aware of that. Secondly, um, you accept yourself more and are less likely to be focused on pleasing others, and you're engaged more in a dialogue with the art instead of worrying about what somebody or other is going to think. Um, certainly in my life, I mean, when I was a young woman, I was so anxious to please, you know, it was ridiculous. Maybe young people now are raised better, I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully. Also, you've accumulated a lot of craft skill, even though in doing new work you probably don't know what you're doing, you know, still. You never do. It's new. You know, you don't know. And even though learning craft never ends, but your craft skills keep showing up to help you. And that's a really sweet thing, let me tell you. Emotionally. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Emotionally, you're very familiar with the feeling of discouragement in the middle of a big project. So you know it means nothing. You keep going. Older people have a tremendous amount to offer the community in terms of shared knowledge and experience. So for me, this last thing answers the question a friend, a couple of friends this week have ask me, what on earth does aging and creativity have to do with the Writer's Portable Mentor second edition? <laughs> it's like, I have no idea. Well, it's something, here's, here's the connection. It's something I'm now able to offer the community after decades of working as a writer and a teacher of writing. As a young writer, I did not have this to offer. And I'm not saying there aren't really good books by uh, how to write books by younger um, writers. I want to recognize Paulette Perhatch's um, book, um, Welcome to the Writer's Life, for example. But um, this particular book, which is just saturated with craft, um, I could not possibly have written it 20 years ago. So, uh, so older people have um, much to offer the community. And then for advantages of being a creator, no matter your age, for anyone and everyone, you're involved in curiosity, in discovering, in creating beauty, in exploring meanings. Um, of writing in particular, um, Yumpa Lahiri said, writing is a way to salvage life, to give it form and meaning. It exposes what we have hidden, unearths what we have neglected, misremembered, denied. It is a method of capturing, of pinning down, 
but it is also a form of truth, of liberation. And I'm going to end with some uh, words of wisdom from some aged, aged, aged creators. <laughs> okay, Stanley Kunitz, poet. He became the 10th Poet Laureate of the United States at age 95 in 2000. And that year he got the National Book Award for his Collected. And he said, when you look back on a lifetime and think what has been given to the world by your presence, your fugitive presence, inevitably you think of your art, whatever it may be, as the gift you have made to the world in acknowledgement of the gift you have been given, which is life itself. That work is not an expression of the desire for praise or recognition or prizes, but the deepest manifestation of your gratitude for the gift of life. Em eminent visual artist Joan Semmel says, in the work itself, you know who you are as an artist. You're not struggling with finding your voice and doubting everything you do in quite the same way as when you're younger. It's all part of self-acceptance. Wayne Thiebaud, eminent visual artist. The wonderful thing about painting as a human invention over a 30,000 year period, it has been able to anthologize a kind of sum of human consciousness, all of our sides, the most majestic, wonderful spiritual ideas all the way down to the brute level of terror and horrendous inhumanity to man. And you can certainly paint anything you want. The only problem is it has to be good. <laughs> Damn. Um, he also says, what keeps you going is the thrill of experiment and expectation. K. Walking Stick, eminent visual artist. Art making is a visual history of our experience on Earth. And this is a fuller way to talk about our lives here, our humanity, our existence, our planet. She also said, when in doubt, make a red painting. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> OK. Uh, and this is the last one. Faith Ringgold, um, also a very eminent uh, visual artist. Being an artist is a way of life. It's something one has a passion for, does, and then becomes, and can do it literally until they pass away. It's an old age thing. You become better with age. <laughs> Thank you.